oh, if someone bullied me in New Orleans, I probably would have never uh, responded back. But if someone bullied me in Fairfax, I'd probably be like, All right, you know what I'm saying? I'll respond back. That's what I mean. What is a good word? Welcome to the Capital Podcast. I'm my brother Jackson with me today, coming through second, uh, 13th episode. You know, really came back from a simple hiatus. Happy to be back with you all. Got my brother Jackson with me today. How you doing, man? Good day. Good day, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Jackson is just, you know, amazing educator. Jackson is, you know, from the area. He has almost 20 years uh, plus and more of just tutelage and education. My brother, you know, he does capoeira, just just a very, very eclectic brother, man. You just want to just quickly just kind of just talk about, like, you know, how you doing today, man? And just like, you know, what you, what you, you know, how you doing? How's it been? Uh, today's great. A little, like, wonderful messy uh, at, at school today. Uh, we had a good event, so that makes for fun sometimes at the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. And so today, um, you know, I brought Jackson on um, and we're back, you know, it's been like about a month or so. Uh, Jackson's been doing some writing. I've been doing a lot of writing. I submitted my national board certification um, for one of my proponents. So I'm really, you know, just happy. Big up. Yeah, man. You know, it's, you know, I finally got it out of the way. And, you know, I'm just waiting to just really, you know, what's the thing I'm looking for? Just, uh, you know, get, get some feedback. Uh, it's definitely been a process. You know, I'm expecting to get good feedback. I'm also expecting to get a lot of constructive criticism. But, you know, I really feel like it's really putting me in this like reflective state where, and I'm not, I'm not looking for results. I'm really just looking for feedback, you know, where it's like, uh, it's always like a, I'm in love with the process. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy. I'm not sad. It's just, you evaluate me and I know everything you're going to say because that's how reflective I am. Does it make sense? Hmm. Yeah. Well, and also the timing of the conversation sounds like it's perfect in terms of your pathway. Yeah, man. And so the topic of the conversation is about identity. Identity as it relates to migration. Migration means moving, right? How does your identity change based off of you transient moving from different locations? We're going to just, you know, talk about my uh, childhood and Jackson's and just really, just really talk about the importance of migration and identity. And then assimilation, you know, when you move, you typically have to assimilate most cases, right? Because that culture or that subculture that is already present is probably not dominant, but it is prevalent. And you kind of have to assimilate to kind of get along. Why does that always sound like such a bad word? Because, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, racism, right? You know, mm. white supremacy is just so many tools that have been used to make people assimilate so they can be dominated, right? You mm. know, it has just mm. a negative connotation. And so we're going to talk about it just from a subjective point of view, objective point of view, excuse me. Um, but, you know, we're going to be real too about it, right? And then lastly, just self-actualization. And I think that's just like the most, like the key when you're talking about identity, right? Because I feel like if you're a teacher and you're not self-actualized, <laughs> These kids gonna eat you up <laughs> in a quick second. <laughs> you know what I'm they saying? They know it faster than most. Hey, quick, quick story today. So you know, you all had the great, you know, amazing fair. Shout out to the, you know, the fair that was going on today. We went on a field trip to CMU, so we took the, you know, the kids there or the, you know, university, and we're doing a tour, and we're, you know, we're walking. You know, I'm being a chaperone. I got eyes everywhere. Kids all, you know, Miss Kids walking to me. Mr. No, you know, how old are you? How old are you? And I said, 31. He said, Mr. No, you're, you're balding. And I was like, okay. And that's okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, that's okay. You know, like nothing's wrong with balding. And honestly, Jackson, that's like the fourth time it's happened to me in like the last week. They're like, oh, Mr. No, you're balding. Oh my God, you're thinning. Blah, blah, blah. And I guarantee you, Mr. Jackson, like if it wasn't for just my strong sense of identity of me dealing with that when they were their age of people mm. commenting on my hairline how big my head was i probably would have been you know what i'm saying i probably would have been a little hurt you know what i'm saying versus we talk about all the podcasts but <laughs> like i don't know how important do you think is just self-actualization and just having a sense of self in order to do this hard job man? well i think especially in the field that we're in with education uh, if you're not real about yourself it creates a real problem and dynamic and in leaving a classroom or leaving a whole community, because uh, it, it it's just something that people smell, sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it's even like the the other side of it. How important can identity be for like helping people? 
right? If you have a strong sense of self, how, how do you think that may impact your teaching or your impact on kids? Hmm. Well, it gives you something to say. You Ooh. bring something into the space that can be like articulated and moved on and worked with. Because real, recognize real, you know? And I think that's just like, well said. it's just really like just important to talk about. So, man, growing up, you know, in New Orleans, Louisiana, Gretna, and I say Gretna because Gretna was a part of my identity that I tried to hide. You know, being so adjacent to New Orleans, right? Me growing up in New Orleans, I was a, you know, only child. My mother didn't have a father for me. You know what I'm saying? So she had to make sure I was tough, right? Or she had to make sure that I was with the right people. So she put me, I didn't go to my schools in the suburb. I didn't go to my school in my district. I went to school by the Fisher Projects. It wasn't easy from the beginning, you know, but Miss Fields was there, right? Miss Williams was there, right? The stakeholders in my mom went to school with a we were there. But I guarantee you, I was not learning. I was learning how to survive in a world that was different than me because I was so different. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Like, what, what, how would you characterize that? Maybe? So I guess a quick question. Yeah. Would be like, do you think you were learning those tools and skills then for, and using them for the rest of your life? And so that's, and that's why I bring it up because I, whenever I'm dealing with kids, I always go back to when I was in elementary school dealing with my peers. Hmm. Hmm. Reflect our own experience forward into the next I was generation. bullied all the time. I was bullied a lot. <laughs> all the time. Because I was, you know, um, you know, in New, New Orleans, Louisiana, right? You know, Louisiana and New Orleans is a, it's a city. It's an urban city, but it's in the South. So it's the country. So you don't think that you are a country when really you're urban, but you are, you know what I'm saying? It's You're a lot of things. You're eclectic. You're not just one thing. And I wasn't just one thing. And I'm assuming or guessing that that's like linguistically. Um, linguistically, right? You know, um, you know, similar to like South Africa, you have different shades of different type of people, right? You have people that are black, white, and then in South Africa, there's a term called colored, right? You know, you have in where Louisiana is Creole. You know what I'm saying? And if you define Creole, you know what that means. What does that mean? It's everything. You know, it's um, it's what is it? It's interesting being naive. Cajun, what is that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sorry, go ahead. No, just for me being a naive person in life in general and growing up really sheltered and privileged. Yeah. You know, I'm not aware of some of the language stuff, you know, and I just have like also, a love for a creative language. Like, what? how do you define Creole? You know, and is it is it charged? Is it is it loaded with certain historical truths that I'm not aware of? Yeah. Yeah, man, I think I think that is like kind of like the the whole point of why what's the word diversity is so important, you know, because I think like when we experience people of different right or people that are different, it's kind of like shocking at first. But then once we get past that scary part, it's a beautiful experience. So when does diversity like become a word similar to collaborate? Yeah, man. Yeah. And so. Right. So like with. Growing up in like Louisiana, right? You know, it was all based off of who looks like you the most you're going to collaborate with. You know, it's clicky, right? You know, it's segregated, honestly, because in the South, you're forcing people to live with each other and they're going to still segregate themselves based off of how they feel through race or through class or both. I remember growing up, man, like just kids telling me, you live off Regent Street, you saw. Based on the neighborhood. Just based off the neighborhood. <laughs> I had no control over that. You understand what I mean? But you can imagine how you think that shaped my identity, right? It made me want to be more like them or more accepting of them or more whatever they were telling me I wasn't. I wanted to be that. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? My brother was literally, you know, uh, the opposite of everything. My brother had the looks. He had the sports. He had the bravado. You know what I'm saying? He also made a lot of bad decisions, too, that I also wanted to emulate, right? And so when we're talking about identity, right, and just being, like, where you're at, how much does, like, migration play into that? So when we talk about, like, moving, okay? So, so you can have different cultures within one neighborhood, right? You can have different cultures within one city. You can have different cultures within one state. But then when you come together, like you said, what does that turn into collaboration? I think that's when great leaders come in. And I don't think we growing up in Louisiana, there were a lot of people that wanted to fight against those systems of segregation. It was more people just literally going along with the 
You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm following it. So migration has been such a powerful part of my life. And I've often wondered if we're meant to migrate all the time. And the idea mm. that we're like stationary and locked into suburbs or locked into neighborhoods. Interesting. Or, you know, area, area codes instead of the fact that we, we should be in movement and kind of going through the landscape of change in our lives all the time. And yet I've come back home after going all the way out to India through California, through Oakland, California. And how did that shape your identity from like beginning to end more briefly? It's every stage of the way it's been a discovery process. So I think times where it's just what people reflect onto you. So being in India and constantly being asked if I'm a tech person or a software engineer and, you know, just having that conversation hundreds of times on the, in the public space, it really informs, you know, how people are seeing you regardless of your own identity. And real quickly, I remember literally migrating to Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina and people, huh? What'd you say? What's a, what's a ponsu? What's an urge? You know what I'm saying? Just constantly not listening to me, but listening to how I sound versus listening to the substance of what I'm saying, caring more about how it sounds in the dialect. And the delivery. And the things. delivery of things. You know, you know, that Creole accent is I talked to somebody who talked to Hillary Clinton who told him that there is no other place like New Orleans and there's no one who talked like people from New Orleans. Would you agree? Well, it's the only food I like. Let's talk about New Orleans food. Food. Yeah, yeah, man. Like New Orleans is amazing, right? That was like New York before New York, right? Because Mississippi River was the great transit. That's where all the goods and stuff came from. And New Orleans was that port. It was also one of the large slave, you know, slave ports too, right? You know? Yeah. It's, it's, it has so much history, so much, uh, culture, you know? Uh, uh, my mother grew up in the New Orleans, just the uptown area, Lafitte Project, six, seven siblings. And this is during the time where the projects weren't the project, they were just housing, you know what I'm saying? They weren't considered the projects, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, and it was vibrant. The project was beautiful. It was, you know, people working, people trying to get a job. I had one uncle that went to the army, a couple other uncles, you know, worked in the, uh, uh, you know, you know, drove for a living, worked in the hospitality, still works in the hospitality. Um, and then my mother was the only one to go to college, you know, and nothing's wrong with that. But everyone's around each other. Everyone's like, around each other. each other from totally and, different And with Louisiana, migration happens a lot because of the hurricane. So people move out of New Orleans because, or move, people move out of South of Florida, right? Because the hurricanes are so mm -hmm. bad. So because everyone is from New Orleans, because of just generations of people in my family dying due to hurricanes because of flooding or drowning, they're like, we can't live here no more. I'm going to Compton. I'm going to D.C. I'm going to New York. And that's how they broke off. Now, from what I've read recently, in a sense, New Orleans was really hard for people to move into in a permanent way from the get go. Is that right? Because it's swamp land. It really is just. You're, you're, you're it's it, every three centimeters every year, it sinks. Every year. Three centimeters. And so. <laughs> Talking about migration downward. It's not, it's a, it's a city in a bowl. And when you grow up in Louisiana, you take Louisiana education, every class, and you talk about the Louisiana Purchase, you talk about the Duke of Orleans, you talk about Thomas Jefferson, hmm. right? And his huge influence. And you also talk about how we don't have counties or uh, districts, we have parishes. And it's right? a French legal system? Yeah, it's a, well, yeah, yeah, French legal, you know, yeah, you know, the French is all up in it. Okay. Now, me growing up there, I literally live on the border of Jefferson Parish and Orleans Parish. Literally on the border. My yeah. mom worked in Algiers, so that's in Orleans Parish, but we lived in Gretna, Terrytown, which is in Jefferson Parish. I was always going back and forth. And I went to a school outside the district, so I had to take the car. So I'm driving, literally seeing the socioeconomic statics change every single day. But it's off of these like invisible boundaries that we've agreed upon okay. throughout our, our short history as a country. And all of a sudden, you know, you've shifted. Yeah. So what is that boundary? And like when we're migrating across it, do we always like realize that that's what it is? So the challenges are, right, just recognizing like how do you burst that bubble, right? And and like you said, collaborate versus feel like this area is better than other. Yeah. And I, I should clarify with collaborate. I, 
I've actually found it to be an empty term recently. Oh, okay. Um, I was around in education when it became a really important sort of change in education. Mm. But then all of a sudden, it's like the term goes into a space where it's like applied to everything. Mm. And it feels like collaboration just became nothing at the same time, you know? Because I think that is that maybe the... We've lost a sense of maybe like the power of individualism with collaboration or we feel like collaboration because we live in such a network based world is the antidote to everything. And maybe bringing it back to your sharing of your growing up, it's like we've lost that actual community that we're around and constantly formed by. Mm. And so we're coming up with these new terminologies as we go into <laughs> Why do we come up with these two new, t- I guess, uh, to, to, to define it for people, right? Yeah. For people to understand, you know, like, um, I didn't know what assimilation and migration was when I was, you know, talking about it or experiencing it. I was just there. So to tell you another story real quick, right? You know, I could never just get out of anything because it's how I talk. My kids always knew that I was different just because of how I sound. You know, my mother was very, very, I don't know, like my, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know why, but she made sure that, you know, (laughs) I don't know what to say, but I don't know. It's something that mothers do to uh, take care of young black men. They do it in a way that is so like strategic, methodical, and just like it's just a thought out process. But they do it based off faith. There's no really. So I'll give you an example. Like my mom stayed during Hurricane Katrina. Hmm. I guarantee you, I was telling us we need to get out. We need to get out of this. What do you, mom? We gotta go. You know what I'm saying? She was an anchor. She was the anchor to be like. You know what I'm saying? You you gotta stay here. This when I was home. when I was crying because I was getting bullied because you know what I'm saying. I'm trying to figure out which group to fit in. Black kids accepted me. The white kids always accepted me. You know what I'm saying? Because they was just like you know it's just what it you know because they were kind of outcast kind of too. You know and, and and she didn't make me move that school. She didn't tell me to like you know. She never told me to fight back neither. She kind of told me like sit on it. You know I don't know man sense of home it sounds like she just was the anchor and this is our home and that needs to be you know kept through all of this change so so when we talk about like migrations what do you think is like the greatest challenge when it comes to like uh excuse me leaving one's home community in like from like loss or trauma like you know maybe you have like some examples maybe from loss and trauma yeah or just like from migration i mean i, I talked about like hurricane katrina can you maybe tell maybe like a story maybe from mm-hmm. saying a recent one in india was from the pandemic where all of a sudden mm-hmm. people were faced with the situation where they had to travel home and a lot of the workforce in india has moved like across the country with very little means mm-hmm. you know awesome. there's a whole economy that kind of supports their you know movement back and forth that uh, movement between where Say their home would be up in the north of India, somewhere. Up what would around, be called, like you know, outside of Bangladesh, say in the Indian side, that area. Is that more rural? It can be very, very rural, or it can be very, very dense and urban. You know. So, so I'm assuming, how far is a transient? Like how long? A train ride would take several days. What? Yeah, and so they oh they had to make a decision to go home or stay where they had employment. And it just fundamentally changed the workforce from then on, where people were just off the map all of a sudden. And then places were scrambling to find it. So workforce labor works with this kind of trauma around this environmental stuff. So I know in Florida, Miami is so just the socioeconomic standard is so rich and high. People that work in like maybe like the hospitality industry, they live three hours out the city, two hours out the city because they can't afford to live adjacent to where they work. Is that kind of similar to what you're talking about? It's similar in a more stretched out economics. So we're talking about people who <laughs> probably live on you know, <sighs> maybe a couple hundred bucks a, a month sometimes in income. Yeah. And they have to figure out a way to eat, travel, bring something back for their families, all on this kind of an income. So let's talk about like assimilation, right? You know, I feel like parents, adults are like the top notch of assimilators, right? They have to do what they gotta do because they gotta make an ends meet, no matter how they feel about their boss, how they feel about their job, how they feel about this situation. You know what I'm saying? You got responsibilities, you gotta take care of business, right? That is a fear of mine. I never wanna be put in a position where I'm forced to do something because I have to do, right? 
And now as a father, has it changed for you? <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, as a father, right? You know, it's, it's like, you know, I assimilate to recognizing I have to get another job. You know what I'm saying? So I can supplement the income versus like me being stuck in my like stubbornness of no, I want to be a teacher. I want to keep, you know, just focus on that. And, you know, it's just, it's just making me sacrifice. Yeah. And when we talk about assimilation, that's all it is. It's all about sacrifice. Be sacrificing my dialect, sacrificing how I may feel about certain things, man. I remember like leaving New Orleans, right? Cause of Katrina. And kind of using the world as like a a metal. That makes sense. Like using it as like a a tool hmm. in the most genuine way. I rap in the world until I die. You know what I'm saying? If I will fall till I die, you know. But it was kind of like a defense mechanism I would use to navigate. Katrina or yes, in what, in what way? So so like pretty much like if I would say for example, like so I was never a tough kid growing up. I was never a tough kid growing up. And like in Virginia, there was gangs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, MS-13. That was the first time I ever experienced like MS-13 and like gangs and stuff like that. And when we're talking about like Northern Virginia, it is a South. It's everybody. You got people from El Salvador, Peruvian, Me- Mexico, Mexico City, Honduras. Um, um, you have Middle Eastern, uh, 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 Black, White, all mixed in one. And I had to make sure I was like, you know what I'm saying? Fine. You know, I had to make sure I was like secure. I had to make sure I had some type of security. And so, uh, uh, I would like let people know, like, you know, uh, not, not say like I'm from the world and don't mess with me, but I had like a sense of like, uh, what's the word? So if someone bullied me in New Orleans, I probably would have never, uh, responded back. But if someone bullied me in Fairfax, I'd probably be like, all right, you know what I'm saying? I'll respond back. That's what I mean. What is a good word for that? That kind of code switch. Faith, being faith, you know, just being <laughs> like, you know, you know, trying to navigate. And that's what I call it. It's really, just really trying to navigate, trying to be more tough than I am, trying to be more, uh, just the word. Um, this is where I really enjoy the capoeira in terms of like, how tough are you? And going into a martial arts space, you know, and a training really helps inform that for me because in the moment you're going to have to respond. And that's when we know how tough you really are. And so, how much? How does that? Sh- how does that play into identity, right? Safety and identity, right? Making sure. Because I told you about, like, you know, the kid who was like, when I was growing up in New Orleans, you from Park Place, so you solve. How do you think that? Like, kind of like, like just feeling like you have to. Well, I was a yourself. suburban kid who always wanted yeah. to be tough and not soft anymore. You know? That's what I'm saying, right? So, they 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 all think because you're from the suburbs, you solved immediately. And, and so, that's not, no, that's not the case. But then I learned later on, as you grow up, the less you prove it, mm. the more you can really be about it. Yes. And yes. that took me personally so long to learn. And so after my freshman year living in Fairfax County, it was time I got to basketball. That's when I actually learned that. that on the court. Yeah, on the court, right? Being competitive. Had channeling energy, right? Channeling anger, channeling. Because I got bullied so much in like New Orleans. Fairfax County was kind of like the only place where I was popular. And it's so interesting how sometimes you introduce like a ball into a situation and it creates an opportunity for a whole new identity. A whole new identity. I was a, I, I turned myself into a jock. I wasn't never a jock. You know what I'm saying? Like I played basketball, 10, I put $10,000 in basketball because there was a black male named Coach Kevin and Coach Tony who I wanted to, you know, I you, went, you earned and saved up and I wanted to be around them. You know what I'm saying? Cause they were role models to the school. They were only black males that I saw. And you quickly became a baller. And I quickly just became a baller. That became my identity. You know what I mean? And and I said it was all assimilation. Assimilation. There we go again. It was all assimilation. Yeah. I remember and kind of like, bro, listen, when me coming from yeah, go ahead. No, just thinking of migration as the opposite of assimilation, perhaps. And so that's the way you're breaking a bubble is by moving across it, as opposed to like, you know. Always going into it, going into it, going into it. And the beauty part about it is that they were accepting of me because they knew I was from New Orleans. They knew I was a refugee. Most people had it worse than me. I was very privileged. Um, And people still are still, you know what I'm saying, from Katrina. So I'm very privileged, you know. Um, But 
they gave me the red carpet. <laughs> I'm the kid from New Orleans, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the funny thing for me is, here I am. Night grader, bro. Coming back to Detroit, <laughs> nearly 50 years old, returning to my home, and I work with an amazing educator at the school that I land up at. Yeah, my mentor is from your hometown in life, my father figure. Amazing, amazing, man. That's just the way that I've moved around and come right back to the same place in some ways. And I understand your home in a, in a way that's, I understand it. I mean, like, so me talking about it, like, does that, some of that make sense? Like, just from like the, the colorism or maybe just like the segregation or just like, I feel like in New Orleans, it was just, I'll tell you a quick story, bro. My cousin just saying, my mama hasn't seen her in like years. Maybe probably the Catholic mom. It was the cousin who always had the headaches off of Dupree Street when me and my cousin Shalita um, and my cousin Dontrell, Dachelle, and Donovan. She was like the cousin who didn't live with the mom, but she lived with the big cousin who had the kids. And she just wanted, you know what I'm saying? She was just like that. I don't know. She's like that foreign family member who was just there. But as soon as like she disappeared from her, you didn't see her in like 10 years. And then it shows right back and up. And it shows right back up. You know what I'm saying? Beauty is beautiful as ever. And so I'm like, oh, mom, look at your sand. Look at your sand. On Facebook, this is us in like Virginia. You know what I'm saying? 10 years later after Katrina. You know the first thing my mama said? Oh, she done got big. <laughs> I love the family honesty in a moment. I'm just like, I really lady, do. you haven't seen this lady in 10 years. The only thing you're looking at is the surface level, right? I remember having to go to the barbershop with pennies in my hand because I was trying to get a shape up every week because I was so caught up in how I look. Mr. Nellum, Mr. Nellum, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and the kids come right back at you with the same stuff somewhere else in life. And, 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 that's, and that's why I brought that up because if I didn't go through those, just literally that, don't say those, 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 uh, those motions, what they call it? The, uh, the, uh, the motions of growing pains. Growing pains. Of me being subconscious about my hairline, my hair, my big head, and me eventually, right? Once I got to college, I started self-actualizing and I didn't really care about what people thought about me. You know what I'm saying? That comment that the kid gave to me, I probably would have responded differently. You mm -hmm. know, I probably would have been like, Offended, but I didn't. I, I showed them grace, you know. But it's I'm still talking about it, so maybe I am offended still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny for me at this stage of like almost fifty, and now that people see me as an old man in a way, you know, and I don't, and I never will, and it's how I've lived my whole life. Is I'm okay. just always trying to become the next best version of myself. But I get into all these situations now. People are okay. They hear Talk me in a different it. way. Well, I mean, if I'm just talking to someone at a cafe, you know, and it's a nice lady and I'm just having a conversation. Yeah. Immediately I'm finding that it's like, I am a dirty old man. And it's like, no yeah, way. which is fine. And I understand the public space has changed in the pandemic and the way we kind of start conversation is totally different now. Here I am old school. Yeah. I like to talk. Yeah. And take why, the, dirty? Take the why dirty? Why dirty? Why? Perhaps I'm putting a little too much on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is like, what? You can come in at Starbucks like you can sleep? I'm just joking. Nothing wrong with that. But um, before the cappuccino, probably. So, so, actually, so has that, like, that dynamic, right? Has that made you feel a little self subconscious? You obviously have a strong self esteem. This, you know what I'm saying? this phase of life more so than any other phase before, but I've never had children like yourself. Yeah. So I can't imagine. I, I have so much respect for, like, fatherhood and I, I really value people who who really give themselves to that because I didn't have it myself mm. you know I'm classic divorced family absent father suburban kid um, fortunately I was angsty and I want to change so eventually I found a way to make a new life for myself and could you say that like you are in the stage that you need to be at for your next stage I I, I don't know I don't know if I can be that matter reflective ever, you know, I don't give myself enough time for that probably. Or just like, do you feel like you're in a process that is in the right path? It's been humbling. Yeah, man. Returning home, I think. And okay. Perhaps that's something that you, you can relate to in terms of going to really incredibly. Yeah. And, that, and that's a great segue to our next part, right? Of just like identity and self-actualizing where you are 
you're taking control of your situation and your identity. You're identifying it and you are stamping it. You're walking in that. Shit, you know what I'm saying? Every single day. And you're accepting the plight that comes with that. You're accepting the consequences that come with that. And you are accepting the reality of self actualizing. But what comes after that? You know, once you identify who you are, you set, and I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is just like, you know, Detroit, I feel like it's home. Do you feel like children have given you a different question on that? What comes after that? Because I've always wondered that from my space. Like having kids? Having children, yeah. Does it make you? Yes, absolutely. Because you're no longer motivated by your own personal endeavors. You have to be motivated to make sure that your kid has endeavors in, in just in general. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Biggest pockets in the world. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And so just like having a kid, right? I thought once I won teacher of the year, I'm just playing. I thought once I, what's the word? <laughs> we had an all black staff, right? You know, Afrocentric mindset, white supremacist workshops. And we talking about racism and you know what I'm saying? Like it just, it just all black neighborhood and you know, I moved, got the house down the street trying to buy back the block and, you know, uh, I'm paying taxes in my community like I'm I'm doing the damn thing, you know, and I saw like a millennial only been doing it for four years as I'm expecting results, but, <laughs> you know, it's, I still feel like, you know, as strong as I am with my hairline and my thinning or as strong as I am with just my own identity, I just feel like there's still more to come and it's kind of scary. Yeah, I feel like in education, it's a similar dynamic in a way where you're worried about what you're sacrificing and then not going across to the next generation. Mm. I can't imagine if it's even close to the same feeling, but, you know, I, in my early days teaching in Oakland, California, I had a coworker, colleague, mentor, and he saw me running around chasing kids trying to improve their lives. Yeah, man. And he called me a, I'm trying to remember what he called me. I'm not a proselytizer, but um, as if I was on a mission. He said, you're on a mission, Mr. Jackson. Yeah. And you can't save anybody. Yeah. Uh, and it was just that moment where I had a real realization for my own journey. Because after you save yourself, you want to save everybody else. Because you feel like... What worked for me could work for someone else. Why not pass the love around? And it's just not that simple. And it kind of lends or the way I looked at things by wanting to change other people. Mm. Fundamentally, I think, limited me and what I was able to provide or offer. How do you think that shaped into like uh, self-actualization? Well, maybe like when you're a coach in basketball, perhaps, and you really want to make a kid into this kind of player. Yeah. You see, you as a coach can see that this kid is a natural with maybe, you know, ball handling skills. But you want to make him a big man or a shooter. And they may be rejected and want to go in a different direction. And that kind of sacrifice you have to make in that moment, you know. It's kind of like this, is it linear, you would say, like in a linear way? Well, I think our identities are constantly shaped in a spiraling way, maybe like a, you know, a mm. linear way that's going around in a circle at the same time. Mm. Yeah, man. And I, oh, man. Wow. I, I love how you just talked about, you know, the, um, cause I feel like to be a teacher, you have to self actualize. If you be an effective teacher, you have to have some sense of strong identity, I feel, right? And then, you're carrying it, you're getting kids to have the identity in the classroom, right? So, and we can uh, just, you know what I'm saying, geek out right now. You know, you've heard of Goldie Muhammad? Uh, I have not heard of Goldie. Yeah, man. So Dr. Goldie Muhammad, she is a PhD uh, in curriculum design. So oh, she right. specializes in making culturally responsive curriculum. She has a book called Cultivating of the Genius of the mind okay. um, and essentially she breaks uh cultural responsive teaching into five components identity intellectualism criticality joy and then the last part is skills and she talks of yeah just trying to remember those yeah things. brother yeah and she talks about the importance of identity and she says pretty much right you know uh you know it 
it, it just literally it's important because it helps students develop a sense of positive sense of identity and self worth, right? Uh, recognizing and challenging systematic oppression and race racism that can undermine students' sense of belonging and achievement in school by creating an affirming um th- themselves, right? You know, you're giving them power. You know, I re- yeah, I related to uh, Paulo Freire's work, and this is probably me okay. dating myself again and being in India. Oh man, that's the oppression of the mind, right? Uh, no, yeah. pressure pedagogy. Pedagogy. Pedagogy of the oppressed. There we go. Yep. Mm-hmm. Similar, not broken down into five categories, uh-huh. but the idea of using context to reflect it back on the educational experience, to break it down and be able to build your own context. Yeah. And so one way is that I've like done this with like a lesson where I talked about like the Flint water crisis, right? And I started where it's like identity, right? So it's like, uh, can you do, is it, why should we drink dirty water? You know what I'm saying? Why, why is that a bad thing? You know, why is it bad to have contaminated water? What's in it? Like, you know, like, or just like, have you done it? Um, you know, and, and I've had kids be like, you know, uh, you know, no, I've never had it before, or I've had to boil my water before, or sometimes in Michigan, we have water boiling advisories, you know, that was a way that I try to get them to identify, like, you know, just experiencing that. Now, how effective was that? It wasn't. Um, and I think the main reason why it wasn't effective because I felt like I, because I didn't identify with that. I took something that was tangible, but it wasn't, I didn't self-actualize or I didn't have like a. And you wanted the kids to identify with the Flint water crisis. Yes. Using the framework I just explained to you. Might be a universal way from what they're interested in. Even if you say dirty water to them, which is. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So even like in itself, like with education, we're trying to be culturally responsive. Culture is so, it's so complex, bro. You could think you'd be culturally responsive and you're just, you know what I'm saying? You're talking about water. And recently just did a last project in India was around this traditional community that dug wells. Yeah. And they passed that on until today. They still do this well digging. And one innovative person in the city I was in figured a way to help them recharge the rainwater mm. and revitalize this traditional skill and make it relevant to the water crisis in the city that I was living in in Bangalore, India in the South. How did the kids respond to that? So it's, the- it's interesting because the park next to the center area of the city has a huge green space mm. and they were digging wells in this park. And we were doing artwork with the university students at the metro station adjacent to the park, like right outside yeah. the cave. Yeah. So I would get in on my little scooter when they, they let me know they were digging, and I would go and I would observe them a lot. It was just incredible to watch them dig a hole 40 feet straight in the ground in a couple hours with three yeah. people. I love the simple technology stuff myself. But we took that mud that they dug out of the earth and painted a mural inside the train station. Mm-hmm. Telling the story of water, okay, the city, and telling their stories as personal narratives in that mural. So we featured them and told them in different textual ways and image ways and stuff like that. And so, how much do you think identity goes into like passion? How do you think that like plays into that, right? Because that sounds like in North Newt's that beautiful mural. They had to be passionate enough, but they also had to have a strong sense of identity to have that passion to. Completed. That's a fantastic question. You know what I'm saying? Because it, the two responses really, I think they go against each other. Mm. Or passion takes you beyond identity. Mm. Is passion that place of when you give into it, when you submit to it, maybe when you assimilate to your passion, oh. you let go of your identity? Mm. Yeah, man. Yeah. C- because, you know, you're always reinventing yourself, right? You know, you're like doing things you're passionate about. It's interesting because, yeah. and we're also trying to let go of ourselves. We are because you're like, you're doing what was previous, but then you're trying to change it and calibrate it. Be new and innovative. Be and new and innovative, but the template change. is familiar, but you're not lifting 30 pounds. You have to put that five pounds, extra 10 pounds, so you can gain that extra you know, but what, so what does that say for the people that aren't self-identified? Are they not passionate, right? Are they and what not about, doing the work, the self-work maybe? There's so many people who can't afford to be passionate. 
Mm. And I think that that's what I'm constantly reminded by and, and try and stay humble. <laughs> It's like, how much of a privilege do I have to choose to be passionate today? Yo, bro, that's so true. That's so true. So I guess it's in the podcast, I think we're saying that there's a balance, right? You know, like you have to have like a strong sense of identity, but it's okay to assimilate when you have to, you know what I'm saying? To make ends meet or do what you have to do. But then you also want to assimilate into your passion to grow better into your identity. Malcolm X has a great saying that I often... Well, give me, man. Give it, give it. That's the best way, man. Give me some uh, brother uh, Detroit Red. It's it somehow paraphrased that you have all kind of isms in this world, all kind of isms, and he lists off many isms, and then he says, "But there's nothing like dollarism." Okay, because they drop the dollar on you, and you fold over. Mm. So, like you're talking about that, you know having to provide and having to find an answer for the next meal, for the next paycheck, for the next bill, for the next graduation, for the next, yeah, year, you know, is that cuts through any time for identity, right? Hey man, I'll, I'll just end it on J. Cole, man. What he said? He said, don't give them too much. You don't let them take control. No matter what you do, don't let them taint your soul. If you believe in God, one thing to show, if you don't aim too high, then you aim too low. So I think, man, I think it's just like a balance. You know what I'm saying? It's just really like, don't let them take your soul. Like, don't give them too much, you. Don't let them take control. It's one thing you do. If you believe in God, you know what I'm saying? Like, you could be all right, you know? So at this stage of your career as yeah. an educator, how much do you work on passion? And how much do you get out of the way of being the, the person or the personality in the room? Hmm. What do you mean, the personality? In the room? Well, I was kind of hearing it as in um, you got to dance through things okay. in life. And so you can either be a really dominant personality in the classroom and get everyone to a certain place you want them in the curriculum, or you can take it to another level and empower them to get to that place in the curriculum. And I think you're dancing back and forth between those all the time. Yeah, I think I am. I think uh, because I've been so focused on not assimilating, but just trying to navigate me assimilating to many things that I'm just not used to. I'm not trusting myself and my passion to allow my kids to kind of like navigate themselves more. Or I just feel like I'm just burnt out. I had a lot of similar feelings at times too, especially doing all the extra projects. And yeah, that's one of the things that I like about your practice a lot is that you're engaging with experiential education all the time in different ways. And like the great saying you said, like, it's just like, you're always going to be doing more than the kid. You know what I'm saying? saying? Like, it's just, and even that can be discouraging because you want them to, It's a more of a problem for the teacher when the kid fails. Yeah, right. For the student. Yeah, because you want to be passionate, you want them to do hands-on learning, you want them to take it, but then if they don't identify it, if they're not passionate about it, it's just going to be a bunch of toys that are just in the toy box that you gotta clean up every single day. And then you're like, why aren't they passionate? Why aren't they passionate? Why aren't they passionate? Cause they probably don't care. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they don't go for you know what I'm saying? And that's fine. And I have to, like you're saying with the teacher who's speaking to you, you can't save everybody. So you have to make sure that you give yourself grace. You're not gonna be able to save everybody. But I feel like if you attempt and do the best you can, right? And you also, right? Cause Bro, we make teaching, excuse me, (sighs) we present teaching as the hardest job in the world because it is the hardest job in the world, but we don't like make it appealing for people to like understand like you are, you are building, you are building the next generation and that requires a, a, a type of person. And it's a performance art every day we go into the classroom. You know and what I'm I saying? I don't think that's really, you know, something Emphasize. I'm about. It's a type of energy that's required. You are on like you're on stage. A type of preparation that's required. A type of mentality that's required. People that are good teachers, they are hard ass working people, bro. Like this shit is not easy, dog. You know what I mean? Today gets the most harshest criticism, certainly. That's what I'm saying. It's the hardest job. The most. That's what I'm trying to say. 
heart is out with the most harshest criticism. And we say, like, you know, you get all this, but we're not giving you what you're worth. You know, it's so it's just it's it's a it's a it's, it's definitely why I'm in love with the art and the art is keeping me in it. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's why like professionals like yourself and other colleagues really ins- we continue to inspire each other. Thank you. You know, likewise sharing our stories and yeah, listening bro. to our stories and just Going for it still, even though it's not incentivized. We're not really socially incentivized. It's all art, bro. We do it for the art, for the kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so I guess to just end the podcast, uh, episode 13, you know, identity, just, you know, understanding that it can change, but that's okay. I guess with some key takeaways you want people to get from, you know what I'm saying? Somehow we got back to education. Yeah. And that's <laughs> what I was really worried about that because I just thought we was going to be talking about me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just everything Calvin Allen, but this is the Calvin Allen podcast. Like my brother Jackson on. Jackson came through. A big thing. Typewriter. Too. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, man. Anything you got coming up, man? Anything you want people to know? We're doing a lot of Capoeira in Detroit. Yeah. And I continually want to share that with people because my teacher is truly incredible. Teacher brings a lot. That any, everyone can grow. And what from. is capoeira, real quickly? Capoeira is a martial art form that's African Brazilian. Mm-hmm. Um, that was started in the pursuit of liberation by the African community in Brazil. Brazil. And so they created an art form within a dance, within a song, yeah, within music, yeah, to pass on to generations. And so it's you know it's been a fairly short but incredibly rich history to this martial. And art. where do you do the? Uh... Practice is that we are well, a lot of times we're done at Eastern Market on Saturdays. Okay, what a, time? There's a thing in Capoeira called the Hoda, which is a circle, and that's where you really play Capoeira. All right, in the circle. So okay, that'd be in the afternoons on Saturdays, and then otherwise we're just off of the lodge at McNichols and Schaefer. Yeah, absolutely. So you got you know some really nice um excuse me Capoeira Detroit lessons. Coming through with just some really good Ray Donald or people, you know what I'm saying? Come to the D, get some good food, you know, the weather, summer is about to be to die for. If not, prerequisite beauty, shout out to, uh, you know, prerequisite beauty for allowing us to be here. If you want to get your, you know, esthetician stuff on, please get a nice facial. This is just facials, really, really great stuff. Um, and then I just want to say, you know, I'm back. You know, I just want to, you know, say thank you for everyone and shout out to all the last time listeners. You know, I lost a couple podcasts or subscribers because I was off for like a month, but then I'm just like, is that just the algorithm? Big up people, make comments. You know, know. know. (laughs) this, this gentleman deserves all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I missed y'all, but I'm not apologizing for taking a break. I don't don't understand people that be like, I'm sorry, guys. I had to go live my life. I had to be my, no, I'm not apologizing for that. It's like, no, I'm just playing. I'm being humble. But uh, <laughs> happy to be back. We'll be producing content every Thursday or Friday. Just so you all know that. I got um, We're uh, doing this basketball. So I'm in this men's basketball league, which is, you know. Still going now. Yeah, yeah. man. And we just, we're going to turn into like a little podcast. We do like little commentations and just geek out, bro. Just doing a bunch of. Fantastic. You know what I'm saying? Fun stuff, man. Well, just real quickly, man. How important is fun, man? How important is having fun? Well, actually bringing it right back to identity, I, I've always thought that play is how we really create our identities and maybe basketball mm. is what we're, you know, getting at earlier in the conversation. Yes. But the idea that we need more open, free play space in our lives. Yeah. You know, okay. I love that. Just place to move. <laughs> we used to tell children to go outside and play. Now they're going on the phone. And that, that shit is just, oh, my God. But you should just, oh. Man, you should see. Oh my God! Bro. Just anyways, count up pocket. Thank you all so much. Brother Jackson came through with the tight writing. We tight them. We talked about a lot of stuff. Please make sure to subscribe to Calvin Podcast Patreon. You know if you want to, but you know what I'm saying if not, subscribe to Calvin Podcast YouTube, Spotify, all that good stuff, man. Brother Jackson came through. Caparella. Big up, Mister Brother Nello. Thank you, thank you. Peace out. All right. <laughs> That was good, man. Uh, training session. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's interesting having the echo and like. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Never done that before. Yeah, Thank man. Thank you, man. Sorry. I was trying to be too long. I'm about to actually go play basketball too, so I don't want to write that. You know what I'm saying? But thank you so much, man. Got a number of love for you, bro. That was. Uh, was that fun? Very cool. Did we talk about what I said you, we were going to talk about? You got it.